Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to this edition of the History of Negro Slavery Path 1. And to you, our dear viewer, it is never our intention to offend anyone with our videos. It is not also our intention to suggest, insinuate or preach hate towards any group, race, tribe or person. There is also no propaganda or any deliberate attempt to misinform anyone with our videos. The goal is for you to look for the books, journals, magazines or other publications referenced and study them yourself. Remember, the time is always right to do what is right. Martin Luther King Jr. And from our brother Malcolm X, you have to be very careful introducing the truth to the black man who has never previously heard the truth about himself. The black brother is so brainwashed that he may reject the truth when he first hears it. You have to drop a little bit on him at a time and wait a while to let that sink in before advancing to the next step. So it's on that note that we decided to step away a little from the plagiarized Negro way of life series but we shall return to it much later even though we will address some issues or sub questions that came up from it in this particular video before we delve into our topic of today. Recall from that series on the plagiarized Negro way of life that we tried to show that the Negro way of life appears to be more original than the biblical account which should go on to show that that's probably where they copied it from. So let us reference a new and accurate description of the coast of Guinea divided into the gold, the slave and the ivory coast containing a geographical, political and natural history of the kingdoms and countries with a particular account of the rise, progress and present condition of all the European settlements upon that coast and the just measures for improving the several branches of the Guinea trade and it was written by William Bosman and it was published in 1705. Note the fact that they had European settlements in the coast because the only way they could have understudied these things very well was that they were living there. They studied them very very well and that's how they were able to produce their book which we have challenged you to go and find out how they got it. At least somebody must have prepared the manuscript, took it to the printers, they read it, proofread it before they printed it. So there is nothing like it fell from heaven, it couldn't have fallen from heaven. So that is important thing you have to work on. But let us see what this account tells us and we compare it closely with what the biblical edict says. So here it says menstruous women are here deemed so unclean that they are not permitted so much as to enter their husband's houses or to touch anything either to dress the domestic diet or clean the house or indeed on any other account nor are they permitted so much as to look into much less enter several houses but during this natural uncleanliness are obliged to reside in a separate house though as soon as that is over and they have washed themselves they are restored to their former state so now we see that this accommodates whatever the length is even if the cycle is four days five days six days or or anything this accommodates it they just have to take their bath and they are restored whereas the biblical account is saying one week so that means even if the cycle has stopped in the third day or fourth day the woman has to still be separated for a week which should tell you that they obviously copied this without knowing what they were copying so let us move forward and we see from the biblical account that if a woman have an issue and her issue in her flesh be blood she shall be put apart seven days and whosoever touched her shall be unclean until the even so notice that this one gives provision for you to touch her whereas that one just simple law she um, stays separated and that's it for the period and he goes further to say and everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean everything also that she said upon shall be unclean and whosoever toucheth her bed shall wash his clothes and bath himself in water and be unclean until the evening now we ask you if the bed if she lies on a bed and the bed is considered unclean 
and you touch that bed and you bath yourself, do you wash the bed too? Do you do something to the bed? The answer is no. But remember, the Negroes all just had it as a simple standing law that when the woman is menstruous, she moves into that separate apartment and stays away from everyone else. So there is no room for her touching other people and other things. That's how the Negroes did it. But this one now gives you the provision for you to touch those things, be unclean, to live in and take your bath and that's it. And he says, whoever touched her bed shall wash his clothes and bath himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whosoever touched anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bath himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And if it be on her bed or on anything whereon she seated, which he touched, touched it, he shall be unclean until the evening. And if any man lie with her at all, and her flowers be upon him, he shall be unclean seven days, and all the bed whereon he lieth shall be unclean. Now, after that seven days, what happens to the bed? You see that this is obviously what they were copying without knowing any details of it. So it goes further down to say, and if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. Every bed whereon she lieth all the days of her issue shall be unto her as the bed of her separation. And whosoever she seated upon shall be unclean, or whatsoever, as the uncleanness of her separation. And whosoever toucheth those things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes, and bath himself in water, and be unclean until the evening. Now we see that this one gives a provision for you to do those things, and then take a bath, and be unclean, or considered unclean to live in. And be unclean in the evening is actually probably that you will be separated from others. Now it doesn't cost you anything, you just have to break the law and take your bath, wash your clothes, that's all. So you see that there's a big gap between this and those who were practicing it originally. You might be doubting us, but all we challenge you to do is see if you can find out how they got the book. That's the important thing many people have not done, which in subsequent editions of that series on how they plagiarized the way of life of the Negroes, we shall show you how they got it and how they smuggled much of what they have in it into the book they brought. But let us move forward and show you one or two other little things before we delve into our topic of today. Let us then reference a new voyage to Guinea, describing the customs, manners, soil, climate, habits, buildings, education, manual arts, agriculture, trade, employment, languages, ranks of distinction, habitations, diversions, marriage, and whatever else is memorable among the inhabitants. And it was written by William Smith, Esquire, and it was published in 1734. Note, 1734 is just about 100 years after 1611, when they allegedly got their 1611 version of the King James Bible. So you need to understand this, because if it is by then they were getting it, that's when the English Bible was made available to everyone. Ordinarily before, it was not for everybody to um, have access to it. And remember, the church, the only church at that time, which was the Catholic Church, was against it because they felt that they would lose money if people knew that things like purgatory and other lies they were telling them were actually a lie. So this is very important for you to know and we challenge you to also research them. You will understand what the books are saying. So we see what it tells us a little bit of what we saw in our last video and then we take it from there. Let us also reference the interesting narrative of the life of Olo de Quiano, Augusta Vos Vasa, the African, written by himself, volume 1, and it was published in 1789. And there we see the following. Those that touch the dead at any time were obliged to wash and purify themselves before they could enter a dwelling house. Every woman too at certain times was forbidden to come into a dwelling house or touch any person or anything we eat. I was so fond of my mother, I could not keep from her or avoid touching her at some of those periods. 
in consequence of which I was obliged to be kept out with her in a little house made for that purpose till offering was made and then we were purified. So you notice that while the Bible says you purify yourself by just taking your bath, but this carried an offering which should tell you which one is original and which one was copied, who plagiarized the other. Now remember, however way, whichever way you look at it, the Europeans that brought the book were not practicing it. They didn't even know about it. Now, if it is the Most High that wrote it, the Most High commanded it. It's an edict in the Bible. Why were they, why were they not practicing it if it was original to them? If it wasn't original to them, why were they not obeying the Most High then? That should be your question. That should be an answer we expect from you. Put it in the comment section and explain to us how the same people that brought it came to stop it from being done in what was Negro land and Guinea. Now that we have a little background, let us reference a new voyage to Guinea describing the customs, manners, soil, climate, habits, buildings, education, manual arts, agriculture, trade, employment, languages, ranks of distinction, habitations, diversions, marriage, and whatever else is memorable among the inhabitants. And it was written by William Smith, Esquire, and it was published in 1744. And there we see the following. As to women, one happiness which those of this part of the world enjoy before those of Europe must here be mentioned particularly, which is their labors. These are times with them so easy, so kind, so natural, and so good that they have no need of midwives, doctors, nurses, etc. And I have known women go to bed overnight, bring forth a child, and be abroad the next day by noon. The aforementioned lady assured me that this was owing to the following causes. First, their chastity, in refraining from coercion during pregnancy, etc. Secondly, to the manner of their clothing, which was so contrived as to confine no one part of the body. And thirdly, to the natural and simple way of their living. She found great fault with our stays and multiplicity of garments and said hard labors in some measure might proceed from thence as well as from the multitude of other distempers but our interest is for you to see where they probably got the idea of increasing the pains of childbirth for the women over the apple and the so-called garden of eden now remember they obviously understudied these things very well and they knew that if they said God was the one imposing it, then it will, the Negro will accept it. Now we ask you again, is it not the same pains of childbirth that women go through that female animals go through? Did those female animals also eat apple? The answer is no. So you see here that before the coming of the slave masters, that these people were like those, people, those described in the Bible, the Hebrew women. Childbirth was natural and it was easy for them. So that's where the slave master obviously figured out to put in his book that they will increase the pains of childbirth. Now ask yourself, assuming without conceding there was no apple incident or forbidden fruit incident because the Bible never called it an apple anyways. Are they telling us that oh, the women would have just been bringing forth children without pain? The answer is of course no. Because the female animals also go through the same process. So let us not just be dwelling on what they are telling us. Let us also try to find out what they are not telling us. But let's move forward. At least you see that the things the women go to church to pray for today were things they enjoyed before the coming of the Christians and Muslims to what was Guinea, Negro land or Negritia as they were called. And um, that should tell you exactly what they brought and how different it is from worshipping the almighty creator of heaven and earth. And here again we see all the time I lived here, I never once heard of those detestable and unnatural crimes of sodomy and bestiality so much practiced among Christians. So this should tell you what they brought. Remember in their book, these things are forbidden. Um, but on the surface, that's what they were doing. So now you see how they came, they brought the book and showed the Negroes that what you do is already what is in the book. 
So don't worry. That's just your your God wrote the book, which we shall ultimately show you. So you see now that this author has confirmed to you that it was them doing it. They brought it. They are now exporting it to Negroes. You see some people today argue that oh no, people are born that way. Oh no, he he existed in Africa before Christians came to wipe it off and all that because the slave master understands to accuse you of whatever thing he wants to do first. If he wants to enslave you, he will accuse you of enslaving others. If he wants to murder you, he will accuse you of murdering others. It's as simple as that. So you see how those lies crumble like right there in your own face. So he goes further to tell us that whether it is better to be Negro in morality or an European is with me easily decided. A Guinean by trading in the paths prescribed by his ancestors paths natural pleasant and diverting is in the plain road to be a good and happy man but the european has sought so many inventions and has endeavored to put so many restrictions upon nature that it would be next to a miracle if he were either happy or good tell the guinean of chastity and of living celibate and he laughs at it as a chimera and says that there is neither chastity nor modesty in living the life of a monk or a nun and that that religion which puts on nature such negatives is a religion unreasonable and unnatural chastity and modesty he says consists in refraining from women when they are pregnant or menstruous and in not lying with women in the streets or before another man for which reason it is when they go to the public halot that they leave their staff at her chamber door as a token and the next comer does not enter till the other is gone but our interest is what he has told us here at least you see that all those vices all those detestable and unnatural crimes of sodomy and bestiality were common amongst christians and that is why they brought their religion and you notice that now it is creeping into the negro society and they now even blame the negro for it you will hear things like it is the negroes that do it more than they that even brought it now ask yourself how come the book they brought condemns all these things but they do it as against the negroes that were not doing it without a book so you understand where this whole thing is going and we challenge you to conduct basic research on where they could have gotten the book they brought from certainly it did not fall from the skies which you know somebody put it together somebody arranged it somebody typeset it somebody printed it and that is what you should find out and find out when the first prints were made even though we had shown it in some videos before let us then reference an account of two missionary voyages by the appointment of the society for the propagation of the gospel in foreign parts and it was written by Thomas Thompson and it was published in 1758. Note the date of publication 1758. That's barely 150 years after the 1611 KJV. So we see some of these accounts. Remember, we were not to go back to this um, plagiarized way of life until a later time when all we have said already may have sunk in because we don't want to continue in that path for now. So before we delve into our topic of today, let us just round this issue with this. The blacks, when they are a little chaffed with ridicule for being so senseless as to pay worship to a stone, pretend it is not the rock that they call Tabera and make their offerings to but a being or fetish which inhabits there and which some of them tell that they have seen diverse times but they constantly speak of the rock itself by the name simply never calling it tabera nife or naden to distinguish it as his house so jesuitical is idolatry among pagans as well as christians nay further those solemnities i have mentioned are sometimes denied to mean any other than the worship of god and to give a color to this fetish they have a legend that once in ancient time so before we read this portion let us go to the bible in exodus chapter 20 verse 25 and see what it says and if thou wilt make me an altar of stone thou shalt not build it of hewn stone for if thou lift up thy tool upon it 
thou hast polluted it. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. Now remember, the way they sold their book to the Negroes was to tell them that it was from their God and it was whatever they, they were doing that their God wrote. This is very important to note. So now, can you tell us how this relates to the altar you see in your church or your mosque or anywhere else? You see that they have successfully deceived the Negroes. So, but let us round up with the story that follows that account that we were reading. So going further, it says, They have a legend that once in ancient time, a fisherman, as he was exercised in his calling, was swallowed up by the sea. And after forty days, being cast up again, he came on shore with his message from God that the people were commanded to make Tabera the solemn place of his worship. For that time forward, here it is easy to know that this prophet's name was Jonah. Now we ask you, this European was writing about the stone they were worshipping. But now he also recognizes that there is a prophet called Jonah. Based on the story they have told, remember their narrative is different from the biblical Jonah story. So that should tell you, in the biblical one, they were told, or we were told that the fish swallowed Jonah. But in the Negro legend, it says water carried somebody. However, they came up with that. But we shall look at those in subsequent editions in the series on how they plagiarized or could have plagiarized the Negro way of life and used it to produce their book. So we will now go further to look at the history of Negro slavery, which is supposed to be our topic of today. Let us then reference a tropical dependency an outline of the ancient history of the Western Sudan with an account of the modern settlement of Northern Nigeria by Flora L. Shaw in bracket Lady Lugard and it was published in 1905 and there we see the following that from time immemorial the slave trade of the ancient world had its markets of supply in the Sudan the earliest Greek historians speak of slaves captured by the native tribes of North Africa and the monuments of Persia and Ethiopia show that the enslavement of the Negro was a custom more ancient than any written record. Note that very well, more ancient than any written record. That means it predates the writing of the books. Now remember, if you were to apply deductive reasoning, you would discover that things like Abraham or whatever things you have there happened before books were discovered. Abraham didn't read or have any books. Isaac didn't. Esau didn't, Abel didn't. So you have to understand the meaning of what is being said here. It says written record. Now we'll show you a little difference because from the same book, so you understand exactly what we are trying to insinuate. But let's read further down. It says in modern times, the horrors of the African slave trade have been fully exposed by the great army of explorers who have penetrated into the interior of the continent. Livingstone, Baker, Stanley, Cameron and many others have given the testimony of eyewitnesses to the sufferings of the natives whom the demand for slaves caused to be hunted like wild beasts in their homes. So now you see what we are talking about. That they were treated as wild beasts at that time. We see where it says here with this slight indication that the native traditions of the Sudan are not without some foundation in recorded history. We may return to what should be the shorter if narrower ground of local chronicles. But our interest is where it says recorded history. And our challenge to you is to find out the difference between recorded history and written record. Remember, in the case of Negro slavery, it said written record. In this one, it says recorded history. Two different things, but we just wanted to have a feel of what the semantics are supposed to be doing. Let us also reference the history of slavery and the slave trade. Ancient and modern, the African slave trade and the political history of slavery in the United States compiled from authentic materials by W. O. Blake and it was published in 1860 and there we see the following. 
The Portuguese were the first to set the example of stealing Negroes. Not this very well. Remember in one of Professor Gates' videos, someone was saying that no European ever set foot into Africa to steal or capture the slaves, which we all know is a very big lie. So because those things are choreographed, they are paid to say those things. So you see who started it. They were the first to become acquainted with Africa till the 15th century. No part of Africa was known except the chain of countries on the coast of the Mediterranean and the Red Sea, beginning with Morocco and ending with Abyssinia and the adjoining desert. The Arabs and Moors, indeed, traversing the letter, knew something about Ethiopia or the land of the Negroes, but what knowledge they had was confined to themselves and to the Ethiopians, the whole of the continent to the south of the desert was an unknown and unexplored land. And further down it says, as early as 1434, Antonio Gonzalez, a Portuguese captain, landed on this coast and carried away with him some Negro boys whom he sold to one or two Moorish families in the south of Spain. So again, we see how it all started. Remember today, all you hear is something like Africans sold other Africans. No one talks about who in Africa sold the other. No one talks about who started it. No one talks about the seller or the buyers. They only talk about the sell. They don't even talk about the plight of those who are suffering from the effects of that slavery till today. And we shall ultimately show you that the slave trade is still very much alive and well till tomorrow morning. It's of interest to note that it is upon Ethiopia in an especial manner that the curse of slavery has fallen. At first, it bore but a share of the burden. Britons and Scythians were the fellow slaves of the Ethiopian, but at last all the other nations of the earth seemed to conspire against the Negro race, agreeing never to enslave each other but to make the blacks the slaves of all alike. Thus, this race of human beings has been singled out whether owing to the accident of color or to their peculiar fitness for certain kinds of labor, for infamy and misfortune, and the abolition of the practice of prom promiscuous slavery in the modern world was purchased by the introduction of a slavery confined entirely to Negroes. Note this very well. Confined entirely to Negroes. We shall examine that in more detail later. But you may have seen what the Chinese are doing in what is um, Negro land today with the women. That's exactly how it happened too. So when you see those things, do you think those governments there are not seeing it? They are seeing it. But because they are not the same with the negroes they don't care that's why you see the wars and everything the weapons pass on from the slave masters to their foot soldiers there so when you see those things those governments there are not negroes they might look black yes but not all blacks are negroes not all africans are also negroes one thing you have to bear in mind is that their conspiracy includes that negroes must not lead they must only serve you have to bear this in mind. We can't go further on it for now. Let us also reference the African Repository, Volume 47 of 1869, and it was published by the American Colonization Society in 1869. And there we see the following. I'm reading from within the highlighted portion. It says, Now with these well-known principles before us, why should it be considered strange that, with their fall into barbarism, the handsome Ethiopians of Homer and Herodotus should have deteriorated in physical type and that this degeneration or degradation of type should continue reproducing itself in the wilds of Africa and in the Western Hemisphere where they have been subjected to slavery and various other forms of debasing proscription? The Negro is often tempted by superficial investigators with proofs, as is alleged, taken from the monuments of Egypt of the servitude of Negroes in very remote ages. So our interest is the remote ages and monuments of Egypt. 
So they believe that Negroes were created to be slaves and they are supposed to be slaves forever. So when you are looking at them doing certain things with their foot soldiers in sub-Saharan Africa, you have to understand where they are coming from and where they are going to. Let us also quickly reference Encyclopedia Britannica or a dictionary of arts, sciences and miscellaneous literature and it was published in 1823 and there we see the following. So it says about Abyssinia, Abassia or Upper Ethiopia in geography, an empire of Africa within the torrid zone which is comprehended between the 7th and 16th degree north latitude and the 30th and 40th degree of east longitude. By some writers of antiquity, the title of Ethiopians was given to all nations whose complexion was black. Hence we find the Arabians as well as many other Asiatics sometimes falling under this denomination besides a number of Africans whose country lay at a distance from Ethiopia properly so called. Thus the African in general were divided into the Western or Hesperian Ethiopians and those above Egypt situated to the east, the latter being much more generally known than the former by reason of the commerce they carried on with the Egyptians. So but our interest is where it says everyone was called Ethiopians. Notice that it is the same thing you hear from the, the descendants of um, the slave hunters. They tell you that all of us today are Negroes. Everyone is Negroes. We are all Africans. We are all Negroes because we are black. It is the same thing. If you follow closely and read between the lines, you will discover that the slave master's game follows the same pattern. And they use their foot soldiers the same way. Their foot soldiers are people that lack basic intelligence according to the slave master himself. So whatever thing they are told, they are so pliable. They buy into it and are ready to kill the person they are saying is their fellow African over it. For example, if you were to go and say something like um, Nigeria wasn't created by God, they are going to attack you. Even though they know that it was created by the slave masters, that's who the foot soldiers are. That's exactly who they are. So we brought this because of some people who were asking what were the Negroes called before being called Negroes. And that's for those who read one chapter or one line and run with it. Mostly the Christians and Muslims, they just pick one verse, one chapter, and that's what they will be saying. So they don't ever include context in whatever they are saying. But let us move forward. Let us also reference an historical sketch of slavery from the earliest periods by Thomas R. R. Cobb and it was published in 1858 and there we see the following. That the Negro among the Jews as everywhere he is found was of a proscribed race. He was even forbidden to approach the altar to offer the bread of his God. So. The treatment of this class of slaves among the Hebrews was extremely rigorous. Corporal chastisement was customary and sometimes resulted in death. In such event, if the death was immediate, the master was punished. But if the slave lingered a day or two, he was not punished. For, said the law, he is his money. If the slave was maimed by loss of an eye or a tooth, the penalty was his enfranchisement. The slave sometimes escaped, in which event the master had the right of recaption. This right seems to have extended to the territory of the neighboring nations, as was exemplified in the case of Shimel pursuing his fugitives into the territory and even the house of the king of Gath. With the characteristic exclusiveness of the Jews, they denied the right to other nations whose slaves sought refuge among them. The status of the class of servants was very different from that of the Hebrew servants. He was entitled to no civil rights, could make no complaint against his master and could not be heard as a witness. He could not redeem himself because he could acquire nothing. Now remember, we had told you that they plagiarized the Negro way of life, used it to produce their book. Now you notice that the book is telling them what and how to deal with the slaves. Are you telling us that the Most High could have written all this in his book? 
And we could have, we challenge you to it. All we challenge you to do first is to tell us when the book was first published. However they got it, whoever wrote it, when was it first published? If your research question could just be when it was first published, then you would tell us where they got it from. Whether you can find out or not is a different thing, but our interest is if you tell us when it was first published, it will be incumbent on us to look at if it predates the slave trade. Now, remember, we had shown you where it showed how ease the Negro women were delivering their babies at that time. And our challenge to you is to now tell us if it wasn't where they copied all the things they wrote in their book from. At least from the account of that author, we get what we need. And again, you remember it says the Negro among the Jews is ev as everywhere he is found was of a proscribed race. And again, we challenge you to tell us who could have proscribed him and who it was that said he was even forbidden to approach the altar to offer the bread of his God. These are our questions to you. And the only reason they have the temerity to do all this is because the Negro believes their God, their God, their deity is actually the creator of heaven and earth which is not true because if you checked it very well these things are not things the creator of heaven and earth would survive would support by whatever means you look at it whichever way you look at it that they have a book does not make them any more righteous than the negroes and you notice from historical records that they accused the negroes of what they were doing and because of miseducation some people believe their lies let us reference observations on the slave trade and a description of some part of the coast of Guinea during a voyage made in 1787 and 1788 in company with Dr. A. Sperman and Captain Arrhenius by C. W. Wardstrom and it was published in 1789 and there we see the following that the unhappy captives many of whom are people of distinction such as princes, priests, and persons high in office are conducted by the Mandingos in droves of 20, 30, or 40, chained together either to Fort St. Joseph on the river Senegal or Niger in the country of Gavan or to places near the river Gambia. But when the trade with French on the river Senegal happened to be stopped, which was the case in 1787, they bring all their captives to the mouth of the Gambia, Sierra Leone, and other places down the coast. So again, we see that they did not distinguish between princes or kings or anybody. There is no way your king, a Negro king, chief, will capture his son to sell to you along with the entire village. Who will he be ruling? You need to remember for the slave master to have written that the Hamitic Negroid group and the Negroid groups were not very intelligent. It is obvious. You can see them today. They will spend the last money those countries have to buy weapons to kill people than they would spend in education or infrastructure. So when you look at Africa and talking about solutions to their problem, everybody knows that solution. But the slave master understands how to put the unintelligent ones there so that they will serve as a bottleneck and make sure the place remains how it has been since the beginning of time. So it has been like that since the beginning of the slave trade at least, but not since the beginning of time. But again, remember, these things are deliberate. So, but on the right, it shows us something of interest as well. It tells us that the Moors who inhabit the countries in the north of the river Senegal are particularly infamous for these predatory wars. They cross the river and attacking the Negroes, bring many of them off. There are not a few who subsist by means of these unprovoked excursions. So, the French, to encourage them in it, make annual presents to the Moorish kings. So somebody who the French will give presents to capture others for him, what best describes a person other than a fool? The same way you have to people today whose only job is to kill others with weapons provided to them by the slave master. So that should tell you exactly what is going on. Let us now round up by looking at one little material. And it is the author's prefatory note 
on this book where he says in explaining to the world the atrocious acts committed in that part of the globe to which i have been eyewitness it is not improbable that both the nations and individuals who have countenanced them may consider the writer in the light of a spy and a divulger of those things which ought in honor to have been buried in silence but if they can find no other appellation for the just and pure intentions of a friend to mankind who dares to expose crimes and cruelties which the abusers of human rights are guilty of he then accounts it an honor in discharging the duty he owes to society to be esteemed as such but let it be well observed that herein he speaks from a respect due only to truth with a view to expose wickedness and f falsehood but not nations or individuals now our interest is for you to note what he has written here and remember that the slave master is carefully distancing himself from being behind the rates whereas some less intelligent negroid group are accepting it as if they did something uh, uh, they, they deserve commendations for now let us round up by looking at one instance that points to the fact that the negroes were totally different from the africans because we have seen places where the negroes overpowered a slave ship steered it back to the shore and the natives recaptured them and sold them back to the europeans so if they were the same people that couldn't have happened but let us look at this simple narrative here and conclude with it so it says a french merchant of goree london at a village observed a handsome well-made negro he immediately made application to the chief of the village to seize him on the proposal of the chief the people unanimously agreed to grant his request for it is a law in those parts that if all the village consent any visitor residing among them may be made a slave says a visitor so if the negro is being described as a visitor that should tell you that he is obviously not from there to gain the consent of a whole village on such an occasion is by no means difficult the africans in general like other people in the same unimproved state are governed by their passions and the prince has only to distribute a sufficient quantity of superfluous liquors among them to produce the effect he what he wishes for such was the case in the present instance and the unfortunate negro though he was their neighbor and the visitor was taken and sent into slavery his wife having heard of his capture came down buffeted in tears she begged to the to be bought that she might go with him and share his fate but the dealer who bought him had probably no goods at the time and her entreaties were ineffectual so you see how brutal the slave hunters were and you see the difference between the africans and the negroes we will in subsequent editions show you exactly how these things were recorded and remember the prefatory note from this author who said he was exposing the truth and here we come to the end of this edition of the history of negro slavery we thank you very much for listening and we do hope you will find time to conduct your own research find time at least to even read the comments that follow the videos it will tell you exactly how the minds of the people in africa today be it negroes or otherwise are and what it looks like and what it could have been like back then we thank you very much once again for listening peace